to them. And since then, I've abbreviated it. Um, this is an extract from a larger talk. Um, so I will try and make some points that won't have slides pertinent to them, but I'll talk to them nonetheless. So most recently, I've noticed a paper or a note in Nature or Science, I can't remember which, which mentioned a recent observation. So this is an, an issue that was within about a week old or two weeks old, uh, lamenting the inability of a large fraction of URLs on the web to be accessed uh, in current uh, present time, despite the fact that they have been used for scientific analyses in the past. And that's a key motivation for the purpose of this talk. So I'm going to talk about next slide. Um, first, what's unique about scientific data management? And then a bit about the scientific method and reproducibility. I'm going to assume that there are non-scientists uh, online listening so that it's worth going through the description of what makes this whole process unique and what the unique requirements are related to the scientific method and reproducibility. And that's why I brought up the point about the, the non-existence of some large fraction of important URLs um, in a recent report in a scientific journal. And then I'll talk a bit about the approach that I've been using for about 15 years in a variety of domains, scientific domains, and I call it the digital library framework. And then at the end, I will give some motivation for why this is important for scholarly research, as well as opening an opportunity for, um, I think, some remarkably promising future automation processing associated with the integration and disintegration of large-scale data sets. Uh, so first, what's unique about scientific data management? Well, obviously, the first thing that you think of is that it's science. And science is a particular kind of endeavor that's distinct from other enterprises. And the reason it's distinct is because it's focused on the notion of testable hypotheses, um, a priori, specified a priori, and for which predictions are attempted to, from which predictions are attempted to be made, and then comparisons made to data, observations, uh, output from models or experience, um, to, to challenge those hypotheses to see if they pass the test of complying with nature. If they do not comply with nature, then we say the hypotheses fail and that the theory is wrong. And so this follows a very nice uh, description of the scientific method that you can find at this URL, which is, is still active as of last night. Um, about Richard Feynman giving a lecture um, describing the scientific method. The summary of that is that the scientific method is really a procedure. And the procedure is, one, come up with a theory and hypothesis, um, compute the consequences, that is, make, the pred make predictions from them, and then, as I just said, compare the predictions to observations. And those observations may come from nature, they may come from experiment, they may come from experience. If the predictions don't agree with the observations, the theory and hypothesis are wrong, and it's that simple. The interesting point that a lot of people don't appreciate, even scientists, many scientists forget this fact, we can never prove that we are right. So in other words, science cannot prove anything. So we have theories that we hold as being most likely explanations for what we understand to be uh, the behavior of nature or the means by which things occur in nature, but we can only formulate hypotheses, which we call null hypotheses, in, in a way that we can uh, determine that they are wrong. So we can only prove that a hypothesis is wrong and never that it's right. That's an important philosophical distinction, um, which you will hear abused frequently in common language. Now, if we look at that as a data-intensive iterative procedure, if we now cast that hypothesis-based approach into what I depict as a data-intensive framework, on the left-hand side, we have a couple different ways of coming up with hypotheses. One is to make an inspired guess about a hypothesis, and the other one is to derive hypotheses from research and monitoring projects from which we determine patterns, and this is where things like data mining have some meaning. Uh, data mining by itself 
is not a, is not science, and so this notion that there is data science is a little bit um, of a marketing description rather than a real type of scientific endeavor. But the type of data mining that uh, people are commonly thinking about and using mostly in a management information systems kind of settings uh, are still useful in forming, finding features to help form hypotheses. And that's indicated at the top of this diagram. So we can look for patterns, develop hypotheses. Um, this is exploratory data analysis and old terminology from statistics. That's not a new concept at all. And then we go through the cycle of induction um, from theories, determining what facts should be compared to observations. And then uh, in going in the other direction, we, we make deductions from our observations to generate hypotheses as well. And at the output of this entire process are manuscripts and papers, the results of scholarly effort, which then become general publications in the scientific realm. This same pattern uh, applies to virtually, well, not to virtually, but to rather to many other types of workflows that are not necessarily scientific, um, but have similar kinds of features. And importantly, at the bottom of this, we want to be able to test predictions against observations and also to compare our results to others so that we can determine whether or not we can reproduce results and then by altering controlled experiments, see if we can uh, investigate new features. Now, the interesting thing about this framework is that it has to be cast you know, to a cyber infrastructure today which is constantly changing. So on the left, you see the ancient, now um, centralized data processing systems, which some of us are familiar with and grew up with, which were highly centralized. And it's really interesting to note that these are similar to sort of the cloud systems that are somewhat prevalent today, where there's a centralized data store, which is not necessarily held locally, and the smart terminals, which um, have evolved from the terminals of the type you see on the left through to a more distributed architecture, which would be like the ones that most of us have on our desktops, moving back into a cloud-based, more centralized framework. And the issues associated with moving data across these different frameworks and being able to protect your data, to be able to provenance it, to know where it is, um, the maintain the integrity of it, determine the uniqueness of it, and be able to do those kinds of comparative analyses that I just referred to is an important aspect of choosing a data architecture. So the cloud architectures that we talk about commonly today are not actually data architectures or information architectures. They're a hosting strategy. So the hosting strategy is where the data reside and how they're maintained on that, but they really don't say anything at all about information architecture. It has to be laid on top of it by your conscious design effort. So this chart is a complicated chart. I'm not going to go through it in great detail, but it's here for an important reason. And the reason is that the concept of what is big data or not is a movable feast in my terminology, and I borrow that from Hemingway, of course. So on the left-hand side, you see on the uh, vertical axis the data volume in log scale. Everything on this chart is in log scale. The red lines indicate data volumes of particular types of data that I've used as examples. For example, at the bottom you see the size of a DVD and a red line going to the right. And the time scale on the bottom is in log seconds. And the blue lines are data transfer rates. And the green and the red uh, ovals are meant to indicate, in the case of the green, kind of the range of data transfer rates and delays in terms of time, whether it's hour, day, week, or less, for something like between a, a DVD and a terabyte are kind of in those ranges. And what we typically want to see and see historically are the ovals that represent the, are represented by the red moving down and to the left as technology proceeds. So what this indicates is that the, that the concept of big data is really a relative concept. It's always been around. It's not a new idea. Um, it's just a matter of who's on these red lines and how capable are those blue lines for transferring data. And in terms of how we do our workflows, how long are we willing to wait 
for data to move from one location to another in order to do the computations and analyses we want to do. And the right-hand side is a cost per month for the cyber infrastructure to achieve those kinds of uh, performance numbers. And that framework has always been there since the beginning of computing, and it will always be there. It's just a matter of the details will change because the volume of data and the underlying technology for cyber infrastructure will change. So big data is old news. The key questions never seem to change. What do we keep? What do we throw away? How do we keep the data you want? What hardware and software, what format do you need? How do you back it up? How many copies do you need? Can you actually restore it? Where do you put it? Who's in charge of it to make these decisions? And what's the role of institutional libraries versus laboratories versus individual scientists? So there's a whole social structure that's laid on top of any particular hosting framework or cyber infrastructure uh, capability that really doesn't change. These questions have been the same questions that have been around for a long time. They're going to continue to be around. And they need to be addressed systematically in order to maintain a coherent and reproducible scientific framework. So the scientific workflow, I've already alluded to it, but let's be a little more clear. Um, on the left-hand side, project funding typically starts for a project. Research is conducted. Um, I'll try to use this pointer. Research is conducted. Uh, data and model output are obtained. Analysis codes are uh, obtained or produced, resulting in a manuscript it is submitted to a peer review journal. The journal assigns a DOI, digital object identifier, and historically gains copyright. And then this journal goes out to the audience and or may go to a library, a library rather, who is a licensee to the journal or to individuals who are licensees to the journal. And that's starting to fade, as I'll mention a little bit at the end of the talk. So how do we modify this to collect the, or to include the data authorship and, and publication framework necessary to do some of the things that I referred to earlier, um, maintain reproducibility and uh, coherence. So what we do is we augment the block things that we've already done with some highly automated uh, metadata generation processes, uh, new services like DataSite uh, have come online in the past probably five or so years to enable automatic generation of digital object identifiers. And here's an example at the bottom. So application and quality control metadata can be generated automatically. And then we end up with a data package, um, a block of metadata, or a complex block of metadata in some cases, and a digital object identifier which can then be distributed through various kinds of web presences and licensed, for example, by a Creative Commons license, which is the one that I just started with in using. So a scientific method and the, and the impact on reproducibility. So for those of you who are not um, particularly familiar with this, even though I've described it a bit, uh, this is another uh, example from Feynman. So a student came to Feynman and wanted to do something with an experiment. And she said, under certain conditions, X, Brett did have a response, A, and she wondered if she changed the circumstances, something called Y, would, would the rat still do it? So he explained to her that it was necessary first to repeat the experiment from the other person to verify that the setup that the new person was using uh, would actually produce the same results. And that's the reproducibility requirement. Then once you achieve that reproduction, then you can alter the conditions and have some reasonable, uh, reasonable confidence that what you had changed is the cause of the difference. Otherwise, if you don't do that reproducibility step, you don't have any way to confirm that your experimental results, if they're different than the other individuals, that they were not due to some other factors that, are, that you are not controlling for. So in science, we call this a controlled experiment. So, Caveat emptor to the user of the data uh, for which there is no reproducibility constraint means that there's no archival copy of record, there's no reproducibility possible. And this is because data that is updated in situ, which the government has historically done uh, in a wide range of cases, and I'm kind of picking on the USGS, the United States Geological Survey here, um, typically would update data without version control, and this does not comply with the scientific method. So this, this extends to streaming data that has ambiguous provenance. So if you're 
gathering data from a streaming website? How do you control that provenance and how do you ensure reproducibility? And web services, for example, are a form of streaming data. And what does this mean and what are the implications for data that's hosted in the cloud? If you look more closely at the implications here, try and think about it, there's an asterisk here, a uh, note that's more or less footnoted, uh, that values may change as grid estimates are approved by the addition of new soundings and contours. So this means that the data can change in place, and that's a bad thing typically. In other words, if you want to maintain reproducibility, uh, you need, to, as a user, you need to make a copy of the data and maintain that copy so that you can compare it to a future state of data that are changed in C2 like this. Okay, let's go forward. So the implications are that input and output data must be preserved over time and version together. Processing scripts and codes must be preserved in association with the input and output data. Uh, the nature of the computing platforms used to obtain particular results must be documented, and I analogize this to bug tracking and bug fixing in open source projects in order to be able to reproduce conditions to share with the, the co-developers. You need to be able to enable them to reproduce a bug in order for people to collectively work on it. Same kind of thing is true with data analysis. So how do we handle this, these kind of constraints and requirements? Well, that's what the digital library framework is for. And what I, I'm showing again, the data publication process, and now I'm identifying it as a data publication and citation process. It's been long overdue. Um, this is a framework which I'm not going to go through all the boxes and arrows, but I want to draw your attention to the fact that it has two different aspects. One is uh, data publishing processing, which has to do with bibliographic citation generation, data packaging, and so forth and then automated metadata production, which is arbitrarily complex and very much uh, application dependent. And on the right, there are examples of three different um, application domains, so the California Spatial Data Infrastructure that we did for the state of California, the CMAP Digital Library, which is a National Science Foundation Center for Cloud Modeling, and then a California Coastal Atlas application, which I currently maintain. And the these techniques work for a wide range of data. We use them to support research on ships in Antarctica, studying icebergs in the Weddell Sea, um, where we take data from the university library, uh, laboratory, sorry, in a pre cruise condition. The workflow is going from left to right. Um, we ingest Im imagery, remote sensing data of a wide range, and then we port it onto external drives, um, take it to the ship run the same network in the same digital library, the same system, on board the ship to support replanning. And then we transport it back to the university library where that journal publication and data publication processing continues, all using the same portable framework. Um, this is just a breakdown of the onboard uh, system, so I'm going to skip through this. Although I'll make a point here that this is multi-source data, so there's, there are at least four instruments here, as well as a, a variety of aggregational data that are integrated together in the same framework, along with the software that's written by onboard scientists in order to support mapping applications of the type you see here on the right. We also use it to support um, scientific projects that come and go. Many scientific projects are grant-based, if not most. So they have relatively short lifetimes. So we may support a group like this one here on coastal hypoxia and ocean acidification, or the U.S. Navy sea level rise risk management framework, um, and require only that these teams adhere to our standards of scientific and editorial quality control, which they have to do in one form or another. It's just a matter of doing it in a particular way, and this maintains a uh, and supports a, an effective quality review, which is a key part of sound scientific data. And then we publish the high quality data that is both citable and cross-referenced through the, uh, through the platforms like the California Coastal Atlas. This slide didn't come out right, so I'm just going to talk through it. There should be some annotations on the right. But what this is meant to indicate is here is a fused data product in the stack of the, in the white of data that go into the map that you see in the background of the San Diego Bay telemetry and topography, 
these are individual uh, data layers that are individually identified by visual object identifiers. They're fused together into a composite, which is represented by the map in the background, which has its own DOI. So this is a strategy for taking, um, for maintaining traceability to source data through the use of DOIs, creating a composite result, which can then be broken down and reverse engineered into its subordinate parts. And I'll take this up later. We're getting close to that later. Um, this, this is the key thing for the future. The analyses can be traced back to all parts of the processing such that if there's a problem, as there could conceivably be in an, in an engineering style analysis like this is, uh, someone might take issue with the fact that this is, this is a flood map, so the colors indicate the extent of water depth and the depth of water and its extent. Someone can say that this should not um, penetrate that deeply onto this airfield, as it turns out to be. And we can say, well, what was that data set? And say, oh, well, that's a data set that didn't have the, engine, the new bridge in it. So we can go back and up that, take that data set apart, replace it with the updated data, and, re and reproduce the analysis with the change under control. So why is this? important for the future of scholarly work because provenance can be unambiguously established. This is a key point. The identification and verification of content can be done. It enables chain of custody to be determined and maintained so we know who has touched what data and what changes have been made. Um, reproducibility of results is enabled, and I've said a lot about that, and I probably don't need to say more. Um, and the responsibility and authority, authority can be correctly assigned, so attribution an assignment of accomplishments and intellectual property rights can be properly uh, assigned. An anomaly correction and versioning of singleton and multi-component databases, data sets, can be better quality control. This will be increasingly important. It's already important in the future, uh, especially in California, for example, in the West, related to water uh, rights and water consumption, and it's going to be increasingly the subject of litigation. So all these features will be very important for the future. It also enables amazing opportunities through data publication. So data fusion, which is what I've shown you an example of, can be achieved and increasingly automated because things become more standardized in terms of uh, the metadata content, the identification of data sets, and the way you can specify the composition of a composite data set. And conversely, you can break it down in the reverse sense. You can reverse engineer it. So we'll be able to approach applications that can interoperate reliably at new levels of scale and complexity across disciplines and scales of space and time with an accurate, reproducible history of processing. And new tools can be built to exploit the information from the permutations and combinations of data components, which we commonly do in geospatial data, but we can we'll be able to do it in a wide, much wider range of data sets as, this, as these methods are taken up more broadly. Also, the nature of the libraries are changing. So libraries have historically defined the university, but this has changed. The uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography Library closed. This was two years ago, actually. Uh, and the Water Resources Collection at Berkeley went homeless a few years ago as well. And the UC system has, is reviewing its University of California system, is reviewing, reviewing its open access policy. And the consequences of this could be quite substantial. Um, the comment here is that finally, if the policy is adopted, there will likely be a gradual shift of library funds from traditional journal subscriptions to digital storage manuscripts, to digital manuscript storage and access. This will also extend to data. This could be a very significant game changer um, throughout the basic research community, and that will have ripple effects and knock-on effects throughout society. So this is pretty much the end of the wrap-up. Um, encourage you to help make this happen, to anticipate and think about these changes. Uh, think about, in particular, the fact that it took more than 10 years to get this far from the time that I first started to participate in these kind of activities. And I was pretty much in there at the beginning. Um, encourage your departments and institutions to, to recognize data citations and merit criteria, whether you're in an academic or non-academic non setting. Start using them in your manuscripts. Find out what your organizations are doing or not doing. Um, and try and push them in the right direction. And importantly, teach the next generation about it, uh, whether they're students or colleagues, junior colleagues. Um, my sense is that this is really a generational change. 
the changes that have occurred now have occurred because of generational change and more, greater familiarization with technology, and it's probably going to take another generation before this becomes a non-subject for these kinds of talks. So thank you very much, and um, take questions uh, when the stop is ready to moderate that. Thank you very much, John. Um, this is um, extremely interesting. And um, so I have an immediate question, a burning question. You say it will take another generation. So h how long is it going to take? Uh, I, I, to me, a generation is, is a 10-year window. So a 10-year window. Okay. A 10-year window of time that students enter uh, undergraduate education through a graduate education. I'm thinking of from a scientific perspective. So that's you know, somewhere around 10 years. So a 10-year ten, a ten window to reach a situation where data publication becomes the norm, or do you see this going even beyond in terms of, for example, being able to seamlessly integrate data sets across disciplines? Well, I think more the latter. I think, I think we're within about five years where data publication will be the norm. So I expect this to... Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is there, the reason I'm giving this talk today is because it's still a topic of discussion and it's still a topic of education and outreach. Um, in 10 years, I don't think it would be necessary for me to give a talk like this. But somewhere five years from now, I would expect um, this to be routine and familiar to most new scientists and professional people that, that deal with technical data and scientific data analysis. Right. Thanks, John. So I think your your presentation triggered some comments in, in the question and answers uh, panel. Um, one from Bernard Minster, who you know very well. Um, and I think he is referring to the section on reproducibility and uh, input and output and what to keep and, and what not to keep. So his comment goes, one should keep in mind that there remain differences between observational data and computer simulation outputs. For the latter, the volume can rapidly become enormous, but are easier and cheaper to recreate rather than store and curate. So, I, uh, Bernard, any reaction to this Bernard, comment? Yes, Bernard is exactly right. Um, and I guess I should draw that distinction myself more, more tightly. Uh, however, it's only a slight difference from what the concept is overall. The, the ability to recompute a result is a trade-off between the availability of the old computing technology and um, what's available at the time you want to reproduce it. And so, and so this is a historical conventional trade-off between compute or store. And Bernard's right, that that's a choice that you can make, um, subject to the constraint that you can actually redo the computation. There are some computations that probably people wouldn't attempt to redo, and but yet um, wish had not been stored. And so it's a, there's no simple solution there, and it's, it's a very subjective call. The, a good example of it is the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They have a huge set of climate model runs that are being used broadly by a large population of analysts. And if some large fraction of those went away, I guess it would be interesting to have Bernard have a chance to say what he, how he thought that would be filled back. It theoretically could be filled back, but as a practical matter, it probably wouldn't be. And so I think those kind of issues are also uh, important to consider. I think um, exactly on this topic of climate, um, Bernard extended or expanded his comment with a further question. He said, for extremely complex problems like climate, he would argue that reproducibility should call for independent simulations, and perhaps many, by independent software packages on unrelated platforms. So he's inviting you to, to comment on that. I think that's right. Um, there's an unfortunate um, sort of incestuous relationship among the existing climate models and the taxonomy and the heritage of the codes is often more similar than one would like, so that, that independence is not as strong as we would like today. Um, but that's a distinct 
aspect from the issue of computer store. And the, um, but I definitely agree with him that a greater independence of the modeling frameworks trying to stimulate the, um, the same phenomenon or phenomena um, is appropriate. And in fact, that's the way manned space systems work. They, they typically have you know, computing the same orbital functions, for example, using completely different engineering approaches in order to vet them from different perspectives that are independent from each other and not subject to a common fault. OK, thanks, John. Um, we have one more question from Wald Appletons. Uh, Wald is uh, involved in the International Oceanographic Data Exchange Network of the UNESCO IUC. And he's asking, should any change to a data set result in a new version and a new DOI? So this is, I guess, <laughs> a ver linking to the versioning issue. And uh, I know there's a lot of discussions still ongoing on, on, this, on this topic. Do you have any, any views, uh, John? My view is that it should. Um, I think that if there's a change, the DOIs are trivial to obtain, and the consequences of mistakenly thinking you have data set A when you actually have data set B uh, can be extremely costly, both in terms of analyst time, trying to figure out why a result is different, uh, when it, the difference is because the data set's different, and um, just a huge, a huge cost, and the alternative is simply to just get another ID. OK. That, thanks, John. Um, this is um, now um, a last chance to ask questions for John. So I would, I would like to invite the current attendees to enter any last minute burning questions they might have. OK. So we have one question from. Arjan Huganar from uh, Dance in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, so the question goes, should there be a role for libraries or data centers in organizing sustainable access to data? Or should this be a task for the scientific communities? So I think this is, again, uh, going back to the new role for libraries and, and, and data centers. John, any, yeah, any so comments or views? I've always been an advocate that this is the role for libraries, um, more even more so than data centers. I don't think the scientific community should be spending its time doing those tasks because they should be focusing on doing scientific research. And a library should be a resource maintaining the curatorial functions for data sets. But of course, this takes a different kind of librarian from the ones we grew up with. But that's the, the libraries are stepping up to that. There is still a puzzle about how do you integrate the necessary scientific expertise uh, to go along with the data sets in the same way that if you go into a research library and you go to a reference librarian, the reference librarians often are conversant enough with the literature that you can ask a technical, please, technically phrased question and they can get you close. But still, the, inter the integration and the connection to the expert scientist is still an open question. Yeah, I think you're right, John. This um, this this problem is not yet solved on how to to link the necessarily disciplinary expertise with with the role libraries uh, should play in in, the, in this area. So I, I would personally think that it's a complementary role between possibly disciplinary data centers and and the role libraries should should play. Do do you think this is the two can can interact into and provide a continuum for for researchers. I think that would be a, a terrific outcome. I don't know if it's possible to achieve, given the um, the commitments that science that individual scientists typically have. Um, so, I, but this may be a future opportunity for uh, in future employment, um, you know, roles or future careers for students that are dis trained in disciplines but don't go into a research career, for example. OK, John. Um, I think we have time for one last question. And uh, there's one coming in from uh, Bernard Minster from UCSD. Uh, he's asking, do you want to comment on the publication of continuous time series? 
the granularity required by different researchers can be quite different, and thus the DOIs. All right, so um, again, another good question from Bernard. My inclination is to stay, is to publish data that's at the instrument rate level, so that if, an, if a sensor is uh, making measurements at a you know one minute time interval or a 10 second time interval or a, or a twice daily time interval, I would tend to want to archive the data at the sensor rate. It's not a requirement, but I would call this level zero data, and this is a trick, this is a kind of a context that I haven't described at all, but raw data, which I would call level zero data, um, I believe should be archived. Obviously, you can always go back to the level, to the instrumental level that way. Um, however, level one data and, and other types of levels of data that are derived products should, I think, be archived separately and differentiated and identified as derived products from time series. Okay, very good, John. Thanks. Um, I think we're reaching the, the end of this webinar, so I would like to uh, thank you uh, for uh, your uh, availability for this webinar. I think it, it was a very useful uh, opportunity to uh, promote and, and spread the word about uh, moving towards a data publication as the norm and, and going even beyond. Uh, and facilitate multidisciplinary research uh, in, in the future. Um, I think, uh, oh, um, John, there's one final question. Are you willing to entertain the last final question? Sure, sure. Okay, uh, because it was asked before I, I close the call, so I, I feel I have to ask it um, before I, I, I conclude. Right. So the last question is from Virle. Um, um, she uh, is based at the UK Data Archive, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, sorry, Virle, if I've, if I've got your affiliation wrong. Uh, how should academia address the need for young researchers to understand this need for data publication and data citation and transparency when providing university education? I think we're going uh, here in another uh, area. <laughs> That's a great. That's a great question. Um, I'm an advocate of formal graduate training programs in this, so that even at the undergraduate level, students this should be taught as a basic uh, skill set, just like any other laboratory uh, coursework is done to teach students how to do laboratory work, whether it's what laboratory in chemistry or computer laboratory in computer science. This should be taught as a standard set of techniques um, and good practices should be taught. Um, throughout the coursework. Excellent. Thanks, John, for your insights. Um, so I've, I gave my uh, my thanks to you already. So we're closing this webinar. Thank you to all the attendees for joining. Um, there will be uh, a next webinar in July, uh, WDS uh, webinar number six. Uh, it will be uh, for, by Dr. Herbert van de Sampo. Unfortunately, we do not have um, a date yet and a time, but a link uh, to register for the next webinar will be circulated shortly. There will be a satisfaction survey also at the end when I close the, the call. I, I would like to receive your, your feedback if, if possible. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John, and, and goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you, John. <laughs>